We're back with another pitch session, and this time we're going to be going through ideas for what the Marvel Cinematic Universe could give us with Phase 5. So for that, I'm going to be putting on these sunglasses so you can't see me read off the teleprompter. These have been thought of as movie pitches, but I think potentially some of these could work as Disney Plus series or even one-off comic book miniseries. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on with the MCU at the moment. As of the time of filming this, Spider-Man has effectively left the MCU. So we're hoping and praying that that will all be rectified by the time Phase 5 will come to pass. So just go with the Spider-Man pitches for now. And um, obviously, in the case of a character like Bruce Banner, you just have to assume that these are for a limited series rather than a movie. Then again, maybe Universal will play ball by the time we to phase five like Sony so uh, hypothetically who knows I mean some of these ideas are sequels to other ideas in this list so obviously in reality that would technically come under phase six I mean in reality you know this is going to happen anyway so it's just a bit of fun isn't it you get the point A Hawkeye solo movie that's a cross between Die Hard and The Raid, all set in one building and he's got just 11 arrows to make out of there alive as an army of highly trained Hydra agents attempt to kill him. It's set at the same time as The Winter Soldier in 2014 and we learn how Clint dealt with that as we see S.H.I.E.L.D.'s secret Hydra agents descend on his apartment with only one mission, to box the archer in and take him out before he can cause them any trouble. Because he has just 11 arrows, we see Hawkeye come up with creative arrow combinations and solutions to keep his arsenal going long enough to survive. Emotionally, we're also dealing with the fallout of the first Avengers movie and filling in a bit of a gap in his story. How did he learn to cope with the fact that under Loki's control, he killed dozens of innocent men? There's tension throughout the entire movie as we, the audience, are fully aware of just how many arrows he has left, right up until the stunning third act, where Clint is forced to take down the villains armed with just his bow and one arrow. The whole movie is basically a way of facing the criticism of the character's abilities head on and showing that he has all the skills to be the John Wick of the MCU. Hell, make Keanu the head hydrogen bad guy, that would be great. Deadpool 2, 1387. Deadpool uncovers a terrifying secret. His universe has been bought by Disney and it is about to collapse. He, Vanessa and the other mainstays from his series manage to escape through a portal just in time to our universe, the real world, and they enlist the help of Hugh Jackman, the actor, to get them a meeting with some top brass Disney execs to barter their way into the MCU. So you get to say goodbye in a funny way to the old Fox Men universe. Maybe we even get a This Is The End style sequence where you get to see all the old cast back for 30 seconds as they die horrifically, crushed in the collapse of their cinematic universe. We then finally get the Deadpool Wolverine movie Ryan Reynolds has always wanted, in a manner of speaking, as he and actor Hugh Jackman, playing himself, embark on a hilarious road trip to make it to Disney headquarters. The villain, Kevin Feige, played by John Malkovich, dispatches assassins to hunt down and kill Deadpool Mr. Jackman before they can reach Disney and demand to join his cinematic universe. It's last action hero meets Deadpool, and at the end he of course succeeds and we see him join the MCU. And then from there, Deadpool is just in the MCU and he never mentions the events of this movie ever again. I think you could also make it a bit of a love letter to the MCU as a whole, get Chris Evans and all those actors to pop up for cameos as themselves. Oh, and maybe get Kevin Smith to direct it? Maybe Cable should have a fight with Thanos. I mean, this one is basically non-canon, it's technically not in the MCU, so just go balls to the wall and have fun with it. Do all the things that you wouldn't be allowed to do if you actually put Deadpool in the MCU. Also, since we've got the greatest showman in the movie, let's do an all-out musical number with Deadpool and Hugh Jackman. Why not? Thunderbolts. It's Suicide Squad, but good. I saw a rumour kicking around not too long ago that Sam Rockwell and Tim Roth were going to return as Justin Hammer and the Abomination respectively, and well, that's just too damn awesome to not happen. Why don't we chuck in General Ross, Ghost, and maybe even the Vulture into the mix too? And since we can't get Bruce Banner on the big screen by himself, why not have Professor Hulk as the leader of the team and the villain's handler on their mission in a similar capacity to Rick Flagg? It would be great to see him interact with Blonsky and Ross again, and we could even pick up on the threads left opened by the Incredible Hulk. Maybe the team is tasked with taking down the leader, perhaps? Nick Fury and the Children of Thanos. So kind of like how neo-Nazis took Hitler's atrocious ideas and said, you know what, those are some great ideas. I think it would be interesting to explore the notion of Thanos truthers. In the aftermath of the blip, there would surely be a mass housing and economic crisis, the likes of which we've only seen nibbles of in entries like Far From Home. So what about doing a movie that really delves into that? These Thanos truthers, who call themselves the children of Thanos, are a multinational terrorist group that look at the world 
were following the blip and believed that Thanos was actually right to do what he did. So as a response to him and in an effort to continue his work, they start staging bombings and mass exterminations to try and effectively curb the population. Nick Fury is the perfect character to tackle these and it would basically be the car chase scene in Winter Soldier, except a whole awesome movie of that. Make them like the MCU equivalent of the alt-right, and then there's a chance to give the whole thing some political commentary. I think some of these terrorists could even be people who were actually dusted, as it would be kind of interesting to see them hold that opinion, knowing they were part of the unfortunate ones in Thanos' original master plan. I know that Ant-Man and the Wasp was touted as a rom-com in the lead up to its release, but it's not, is it? It's an action superhero movie. So why not lean into the romance angle even more than the action angle and give us our first true rom-com in an adaptation of Spider-Man Blue? The thing that's special about the original comic is that whilst it features a ton of various Spidey rogues, they're all window dressing. The story is about Peter Parker's romantic entanglements with Gwen Stacy and later Mary Jane. Obviously you'd need to change things up a bit for the MCU version of Peter, but I think a superhero movie that finally really puts the romance as the A plot rather than an oft neglected B plot will be something really different. And it would still be really easy to sell it as the book has a ton of tangential action so audiences wouldn't feel shortchanged. Claw returns from the grave, bursting out of the Wakandan crypt as a being of pure sound. T'Challa knows that they can't let a being this powerful leave the city, so they lock it down entirely, putting every Wakandan at risk just to stop him from reaching the outside world. It's a decision that some Wakandans don't agree with, and so the Black Panther will have to simultaneously stop Claw, whilst rogue Wakandans attempt to drop the quarantine to let him out. It's a sequel that once again continues the themes of Wakanda's isolationism. Should they risk their lives to box in this superpowered being, that could wipe all of them out just to save the outside world. Plus Andy Serkis as a being of pure sound is the kind of interesting power matchup that would really test T'Challa as he can't just punch his way out of this one. Doctor Strange The Oath they totally need to do a loose adaptation of the very best Doctor Strange comic of all time, The Oath, where the good Doctor unwittingly discovers an amulet containing the cure for cancer. Before he can decide what the hell to do with it, he's hunted by an assortment of pharmaceutical companies hell-bent on making sure the cure never sees the light of day, for it would surely put them all out of business. The concept behind the original comic is so good it would be a crying shame if it never makes its way into the MCU. The villain of the story already exists within the canon anyway, Nicodemus West, played by the excellent Michael Stuhlbarg, so it would be foolish not to. Plus after Thanos and Dormammu and multiverses, I think it would be cool to do a Doctor Strange movie where the villains are a little more down to earth while still being equally as vicious. A Doctor Strange Black Panther team-up movie. Black Panther needs to travel into the Wakandan astral plane to seek advice from an ancient king, to cure a plague in the city that is killing his people. But for that he needs to go deeper than their means will allow. Enter Doctor Strange, who agrees to enter the realm with T'Challa and find out what he's looking for. Setting a whole movie in the astral plane would mean that you get all the trippiness of a Doctor Strange movie with the aesthetic of the Black Panther movies. Plus getting to see these two get to know each other lays the groundwork for them to be the next Tony and Cap in whatever the next Avengers movie is going to be. You'll get to see T'Challa go back and meet ancient Black Panther kings who will teach him information about Wakanda and his heritage that he didn't know previously, and that could be really cool, plus it provides you with an organic way to reintroduce Killmonger as an astral threat in that dimension. Five. The Fantastic Four are tricky. Four. And plenty of people have speculated ways as to how the team could enter the MCU. Three. What's one way you could give us a superhero team film that doesn't feel like the action-heavy Avengers movies or the space-faring Guardians movies? Two. Well, why not make the Fantastic Four the Thunderbirds of the MCU? One. Are go. I'm not saying they won't get to punching some supervillains later on, but what if the emphasis is on saving people from disasters all over the world? It gives the MCU the chance to double down on the tension of the monument scene in Homecoming, but on a much larger scale. I'm talking an earthquake hitting a major city, or a freak weather disaster, maybe caused by Mole Man and his underground army? As long as they're not a paramilitary group in the same way the Avengers are, and we emphasise the family dynamics, you know, the brother and sister relationship between Sue and Johnny, the the marriage between Reed and Sue could be really nice. Later down the line the characters have more room to go cosmic as James Gunn's Guardians bow out of the MCU. 
Doctor Doom and Black Panther aren't so different. They're both rulers with incredible technical know-how and ties to the world of superherodom, for better or worse. Latveria could be the darker, fascistic mirror image to Wakanda in the MCU. So why not have T'Challa and Reed Richards gang go on a mission to face the not-so-good Doctor? I'd love to see Black Panther have a savage one-on-one -on -one battle with Doctor Doom, only to get wrecked, and then the FF, who have so far been our MCU Thunderbirds, have to step up to the challenge. Richards is the only one who truly knows how to stop Doom, and the movie could dive deep into one of the best hero-villain relationships we've yet to see done justice on the big screen. We're all sad about Daredevil's Netflix saga being cancelled, so let's hope Phase 5 finds a way to round off Matt Murdock with a special one and done swan song. Bring Charlie Cox into the MCU as a way to end his story, go all out on a feature film guest starring all the major defenders from the Netflix verse, and introduce his number one crime fighting partner, Spider Man. The whole thing leads to a final stand between Murdock and Fisk. Plus, you get to see Vincent D'Onofrio fight Tom Holland's Spider Man. I mean, what more do you want? Captain Marvel, Planet of the Symbiotes. It's no secret that after watching her blow up Thanos' ship without breaking a sweat, that Carol Danvers needs a challenge. So before Spider-Man ends up crossing paths with Venom down the line, why not introduce the symbiotes and tackle their origins in space? The Captain Marvel sequel could pick up with the ongoing thread that sees Talos and the Scrolls attempting to find a new home. Carol finally finds a planet they can settle down on, only to discover all too late that the last settlers were wiped out by the symbiotes. And now the symbiotes are coming to take over the scrolls too. Do the whole thing like aliens and have Carol, Nick Fury and Talos take on the symbiote menace who start attaching themselves to the scrolls and forcing them to wipe each other out. You could even have Ben Mendelsohn's Talos be the villain after having his mind scrambled by a particularly aggressive head symbiote. Captain Marvel and the Furies. Alternatively, I'd like to see more of the Carol Danvers Nick Fury buddy cop action, so why not take them to the 80s for an actual buddy cop movie, put them in some Miami Vice style outfits and give it the tone of those classic Star Trek time travel episodes or The Voyage Home. It's not necessarily a movie about the pitfalls of time travel or anything like that, there's already been enough of that in the MCU as it is. This is just a chance to do another period film set within the MCU and have fun with another genre, namely the buddy cop movie. Put them on a case and have have them meet Kid Nick Fury, chuck old Nick Fury in there. I just really want Nick Fury to have a conversation with Nick Fury. They'd probably argue with each other and it would be a joy to watch. The third MCU Spider-Man movie. I liked that Far From Home tried something different by taking Peter Parker out of New York, so why not mix in that idea with a little bit of Predator? Spider-Man gets kidnapped and awakes in a jungle in the middle of God knows where, and he's hunted by an unseen but highly organised and powerful force. Along the way he finds other superpowered beings who have similarly been dropped into this game reserve to be hunted for sport, including an MCU take on the Lizard and Black Cat, as well as the White Wolf himself, Bucky Barnes. The whole thing plays out like a darker, more mature Spider-Man adventure as this band of hunted heroes try and survive. The hunter is totally going to be craven by the way if that reveal wasn't obvious. Ant-Man 3, Ant-Man and the Wasp 2, whatever. Assuming the entirety of Martin Scorsese's The Irishman actually manages to pull off a de-aged Robert De Niro, I think it's finally time to give us a little more young Hank Pym. How about the third Ant-Man movie sees Scott and Hope on a mission to stop a supervillain who's a relic of Hank and Janet's superhero days? And we cut back and forth between two timelines in the present day as well as the 60s. De-aged Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer are working on a case that is picked up decades later by Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly. I'm thinking structurally similar to how we got two coexisting past and future narratives in Days of Future Past. We get two generations of Ant-Men and Wasps, except this time round the old guard actually get to play a key leading role in the adventure. Plus it's a chance to do an MCU Cold War superhero movie. Rocket and Groot I absolutely love the interaction between Rocket, Groot and Thor in Infinity War, and these Guardians seem like the only members of a team that stand to appear in their own adventures past Volume 3. So. Basically make it like a live action Ratchet and Clank movie with them. It's all there and Thor is literally their Captain Quark. I've got lots of muscles, so technically more brains. My name is Copernicus Quark and yes, that was an impressive wall of fire I just walked past. Since Rocket is an alien creature but this is a Guardian spin-off, the awesome mix is a collection of tracks made for the movie from a variety of artists. And it's basically a load of kick-ass high energy synthesizer music that's supposed to be what the alien cultures of the MCU would listen to. 
Scarlet Witch and the X-Men. You've already got a mutant in the MCU, a really good one who's about to get her own series and guest star in Doctor Strange's second feature, so why not bite the bullet and make her the lead in the first MCU X-Men movie? Scarlet Witch and the X-Men would see Wanda discovering the emergence of mutants in the MCU after she tears a hole in reality and basically retcons them into existence. Let's start with a small team of mutants led by Professor X and Cyclops and focus on building a strong stable of characters before we chuck in every single mutant under the sun. You could do a bit of a Secret origin style thing for Wanda, make her an actual mutant in the MCU, and tease who her biological father really is. Weapon X. Introduce Wolverine to the MCU with his own movie, give it the brutality of Logan, but also give him the full regalia of comic book dorkiness at the same time. The yellow suit, the big hair, all of it. Have him fight the Hulk in the opening sequence because that would be cool, finally do Sabretooth and his rogues gallery justice, and do the full on comic booky Wolverine movie we've never really gotten. Have the X-Men be their own thing for a little while, and then it will be exciting when they eventually meet Logan. In the same way it was exciting to see new characters cross paths in the first Avengers movie and Infinity War. Seeing them without Logan instantly allows the MCU X-Men to feel fresh and different in comparison to the old Fox universe. So then once we've gotten our Scarlet Witch in the X-Men movie and the Wolverine solo movie, we can bring them together in an X-Men sequel. This should be the one where they face Magneto now that they're all established and gives us a reason to rate him as a contender for best MCU villain. If Scarlet Witch is still our lead character for this series, it makes perfect sense for her to discover the true nature of her parentage and face her father. Maybe even take a leaf out of the Ultimate comic run and start Wolverine off on the Brotherhood side? Again, that's something we haven't seen in the movies before, give us something different Different. Plus it would be great to see the X-Men coordinating all of their strength to take down an animalistic, rage fueled Wolverine. The Illuminati. Now that Professor X and Reed Richards are in the MCU, why not do the Illuminati? Alongside Black Panther, Doctor Strange, and since Tony is long gone, what about bringing Rescue aka Pepper Potts into the fold as the Iron Man replacement? It could tell a story set over several years of the MCU. We see past events again but from the perspective of the Illuminati, who have actually had a helping hand in ensuring the heroes win in several unexpected ways. Their sometimes unorthodox methods come under flack from the other heroes. Or you make it like DC's Tower of Babel, where a supervillain uses the Illuminati's recorded knowledge of events against all of Earth's defences and exploits their knowledge of the superhero's weaknesses to incapacitate them. Since they're all brainiacs, the leader could tie in here nicely too as the antagonist who best suits them. A Hulk solo movie. Bruce Banner journeys into his own mind to extract a part of his psyche known as the Devil Hulk. As he journeys inside his own consciousness, he comes face to face with haunting memories we've never seen before, as well as other manifestations of the Hulk like Joe Fixit. The whole thing is like the plot of Inception, but in Bruce Banner's head. For the first time in the MCU, we get to see Bruce Banner and the Hulk side by side, working together within Banner's minds to save the day. At the end, the Hulk and Banner put aside their differences, seen for the duration of the adventure together as two separate beings and merge together into the Professor Hulk. So basically this whole movie is what happened when Banner described spending 18 months in a gamma lab to fix his condition in Endgame. 18 months in a gamma lab. I put the brains and the brawn together and now look at me. This is what he actually did. Here is us seeing it happen. It's a chance to make a trippy Hulk movie that's basically a kind of into the Hulk verse, and it provides some resolution to the original version of that Hulk as we kind of never saw them again after Infinity War. And that was kind of weird. A 1960s World War II Captain America Iron Man movie. Hear me out. I don't want to see the original recipe Iron Man or Captain America return to the fold in the main MCU timeline, but what about some alternate reality storylines that exist as one and done features with different actors playing these iconic roles? In a world where World War II raged on under the might of the Red Skull, and it was Bucky who ploughed the plane into the ice, not Cap, we find the would-be first Avenger still fighting by the time we get to the 1960s. Think a superhero movie mixed with Wolfenstein and Overlord, a Captain America Iron Man team-up movie with a World War or two almost steampunk aesthetic, free from the trappings of continuity. You'd have to retcon Tony's birth date, but this is a what if style adventure anyway. A spy centric Iron Man movie. Tom Cruise was very nearly Iron Man, and I think he would still be a great one off pick. 
So kind of like my World War II idea, this Iron Man movie would be entirely standalone, another what if. And you do it like Mission Impossible with a focus on espionage, big heists, gadgets and suspense with the sensibilities of a superhero movie. Cruise could totally pull it off and if he's not going to end up as Green Lantern it would be cool to see him do at least one superhero adventure. It's Mission Impossible meets the first Iron Man movie. Hawkeye vs Kang the Conqueror. I just really like the idea of probably the least powerful Avenger going up against one of their most powerful enemies with nowhere near the skills or the know-how to beat the guy, and he's completely alone. He called the other Avengers but everyone went to answer phone. We've seen Clint get a taste of going into space, and he notes how out of his comfort zone he was then, so naturally the thing to do would be to put him in his own big cosmic adventure, right? Just how would he find a way to defeat a being like Kang? The Secret Avengers. Following bearded Nomad Cap, Black Widow, the Falcon and Scarlet Witch as they go on the run in the intervening years between Civil War and Infinity War. You can use it to explore the actual outcome of the Sokovia Accords and show just how hard it was for them to stop evildoers whilst being cornered by authorities at every turn. Plus it's a chance to use the awesome unused idea for Cap 3 which was the Mad Bomb storyline. I don't expect Chris Evans to come back as Captain America on screen and I wouldn't want him to, so what if this was an animated miniseries where he lent his voice to the character. Captain America Through Space and Time, a final MCU Steve Rogers adventure where we see him journey across space and time to put back the Infinity Stones after the events of Endgame, armed with Milnor and dressed in that dope white quantum suit, make the Red Skull the antagonist freed following the destruction of the stones, have enchanted Hammer Cap fight a supernatural all-seeing Red Skull across time and space in an epic space opera. You could even have Peggy come along for the adventure, and the vibe is less Winter Soldier and more in line with the campier antics of this first solo movie. In short, I badly want to see how he returned those stones and reunited with Peggy. I'm not kidding myself, this one would definitely have to be a comic miniseries, but a Cap fanboy can dream, you know? Since it's across space and time, what if Sam Wilson's cap shows up alongside the White Wolf and they all team up to take on Red Skull, Armin Zola shows up in his robot body, Cap becomes Werewolf Cap, the whole thing expands into 10 more movies, they go into alternate realities, Arnold Schwarzenegger's like an alternate reality Captain America and then he joins them and Chris Evans never leaves. A live action Spider-Verse. We've already gotten a great Spider-Verse movie, so I think if you want to do it in live action, it's got to take a leaf out of X-Men Days of Future Past's book, in which we bring the cast together from each Spider-Man film series. It's a chance to round off the previous iterations of Spider-Man that didn't get the closure they deserved. We get the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 4 we never got, the chance for Andrew Garfield to prove he was a good Spider-Man, plus the villain could be multiple Norman Osborns. That is Willem Dafoe, Chris Cooper, and whoever they cast in the MCU, like... Jason Isaacs? Make it a cool little adventure for Tom Holland's Spider-Man in its own right, whilst also being a love letter to the Spider-Man film canon that has existed since 2002. A Spider-Man Blade movie. Now I know the incredibly talented Mahershala Ali will be playing Blade in a solo movie with an, as of this recording, unannounced release date. That should be a bombastic, horror-focused, R-rated actioner to rival the fantastic Wesley Snipes 1998 original. However, in the vein of Civil War, which introduced Spider-Man and Black Panther to the MCU, I think it would be cool to kick off Ali's tenure as the Vampire Hunter with a Spidey team up against Morbius. Bring Blade into Spider-Man's PG-13 world precisely because he's not of that tone. It gives you a chance to take the cutesier high school Spider-Man movies and push them into darker territory. Peter would be forced to grow up and contend with a vicious, vampiric villain in Morbius, and Blade, a guy that is not going to pull the wool over his eyes or mince words. And then by the time we come to his solo feature, there's the opportunity to do the really nasty adult vampire could we get a Blade Ghost Rider team up movie? I'd love to see them working on some sort of supernatural quest and it could be the Gelmo del Toro Justice League Dark we're now never going to get. Ultimatum. Make the big crossover event for Phase 5 Galactus coming to eat the Earth. It's primarily a Fantastic Four movie supported by the Avengers and the X-Men, in the same way Infinity War was an Avengers movie supported by the Guardians. If the Fantastic Four were to be the MCU Thunderbirds, it makes perfect sense to see them tackle a planet-wide disaster movie narrative as Galactus takes the entirety of the planet. It's exactly the kind of threat in a post-Infinity War world to tie all the superheroes together, but crucially, we could also have some supervillains joining the fight to help as I'm sure they'll no doubt want to save the planet since they're some of the idiots who live in it. By the end of the movie we've established the Silver Surfer as an ongoing character in the MCU and his redemption arc could be explored in the Silver Surfer solo movie. 
take a cue from the recent run of Silver Surfer and make him the Doctor, travelling the cosmos and going on an adventure with his human companion from the Dan Slot run, Dawn Greenwood. As in the comic, having a lead character with no superpowers and no fighting ability would be a nice little change up for the MCU and gives the whole film a grounded emotional core. The Surfer and Dawn are on a mission to track down the wounded, but not dead Galactus, who fled to the deepest reaches of space after Ultimatum. It's a chance for the Surfer to face his atrocities head on as they move from planet to planet and Dawn sees first hand the destruction he left in his wake as his master's herald. And one final bonus round, here's an idea for what the Black Widow movie could be. Okay, so there's been rumours that the movie is actually set between Civil War and Infinity War, and yet we've seen Scarlett Johansson with her endgame hairdo. We know we'll be delving deep into the history of the Black Widow programme, and we're assuming that it won't be resurrecting Natasha, because that would be awful. So what if the movie is actually kind of like It's a Wonderful Life, meets that scene in the Series 5 finale of Doctor Who, where Matt Smith goes back through his own time stream. The movie kicks off right where we left Natasha, dead and at the mercy of the power of the Soul Stone. Since she is a sacrifice, the Soul Stone compassionately grants its victims on Vormir the chance to see their life literally flash before their eyes and say goodbye. So the crux of the movie is about the endgame Natasha going progressively further back in time, explaining the hairdo, as she witnesses all of her greatest successes and tragedies. We go back to her time post-Civil War, we go back to her shield days, we go back to her training and meeting the other Black Widows, we can even get a cameo in there from Ruffalo's Professor Hulk or Nick Fury to give those characters the chance to have one final moment with the character. It's a great big epic spy movie with a high concept twist, and at the end of it, Nat makes peace with her decision, her life and her friends, and she ceases to be. And that's our MCU Phase 5 ideas. We'd love to know what you think of them and if you have any ideas yourself on where you'd like to see these characters go. Hit us up with your own pictures in the comments, and if you like these, why not check out our previous pitch videos. I wrote out an entire treatment for an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie that you can watch or read via the links in the description, and we also did a pitch for a hypothetical Predator 3 starring Dutch himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Until next time, stay milky. <coughs>Full Fat Videos just got upgraded, and along with that, we're upgrading our Patreon with new tiers and rewards just for you. Patreon could really, really help us make Full Fat Videos self-sustaining, and it allow us to make better videos and better content for you. For just $1 a month, you'd be helping us out a great deal already, which is why we thank you at the end of every video. Not to mention you'd get exclusive access to Full Fat Milk Posting, a Facebook group where you can talk to us about movies, TV, and games, as well as some memes. We like a bit of memes. For $3, you'll get access to everything from the previous tiers, but you'll also get the chance to watch our videos one day early, as well as get access to exclusive scripts and bloopers. For just $5 a month, you'll get access to everything from all the other tiers, as well as exclusive access to ask the questions for our monthly Q&As. And that's not all. For just $10, you'll get access to all of the above, as well as an exclusive commentary track picked by you. For $100, I mean, you'd, you'd be keeping the lights on, so we'd really appreciate it, and we'd probably thank you at the end of every video on, on camera. You'd be really helping us in any way, shape, or form if you could consider contributing to our Patreon. We love making this stuff for you guys, and we'd love to keep making more of it. So thank you, and thank you for watching. We're off to go make some more of that juicy content. We'll see you next time. Stay milky.